Welcome to This Is Getting Old. I'm your host, Melissa Batchelor, and today I'm joined by Reggie Tucker Seeley. And he is a Robert Wood Johnson, or he was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Health Policy Fellow. And we were, we did our policy fellowships at the same time. So that's how we connected. So welcome to the show, Reggie. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. So maybe you can, you can just start by giving us a little um, background about who you are, what you do, and then we'll go into your fellowship. That sounds great. Uh, My name is, as you said, Reggie Tucker Seeley. I'm the Edward L. Schneider Assistant Professor of Gerontology at the Leonard Davis School of Gerontology at the University of Southern California. Uh, I've been on the faculty there since 2017. Uh, Prior to joining the faculty there, I was on the faculty at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in the Center for Community-Based Research and at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences. Uh, My research program focuses on uh, financial well-being across the chronic disease continuum, so thinking about how we measure it and its influence on outcomes from research and prevention, uh, throughout survivorship, and all the way to the end of life care. Um, I'm also interested in um, the measuring and reporting of health disparities um, and in thinking about how we address health disparities and try to create health equity across levels of, of government from local to state to federal responses. Okay. So how did you get, in, first of all, how did you get interested in the aging space? Because I think it's always fascinating to hear people's journey of how they got into aging. Um, so how did I get interested in aging? It was really, I think, about, you know, recognizing, you know, the demographic shift that we're going to have more older adults that we're going to have to um, figure out sort of policy solutions for, for addressing that that demographic shift. And I think in thinking about um, sort of dissertation work and trying to find, you know, a data set to do my, um, to do my dissertation work on. And so I was really drawn to the, to the health and retirement study, which is a mm-hmm. large population study of, of adults over age 50. And I would say that my primary interest originally was in um, sort of the, the financial well-being of individuals. And I found this very rich data set um, that had so many financial uh, related questions, um, that that was a way for me to sort of, you know, marry my interest in financial well-being with, with my burgeoning interest um, in the lives of older adults. And so I did all, th- so at, at the Harvard School of Public Health where I trained, um, we did the three paper format uh, for our dissertation. And so I did all three of my dissertation papers using the health and retirement study, um, focusing on um, financial hardship um, and and its association with health outcomes, in addition to looking at uh, the association between um, physical activity behavior um, and, um, and perceived safety. Okay. And so what were some of your early you know, kind of policy interests um, that led you know, into you doing your fellowship? Sure. So, um, so when I was, lived on the East Coast, um, I lived in Rhode Island, but I worked in Boston. Um, and living in Rhode Island, Rhode Island is the small, a very small state, um, which made it very easy to be active in uh, state health policy. Um, and so I was on a commission for health advocacy and equity. And that commission was a legislatively mandated body that every two years had to write its state's um, a health disparities report. And although I trained in public health, I had no idea how to write a state health disparities report. Um, And then I realized, oh, if I don't know how to do this, chances are most of our students don't know how to do this either. So I I ended up developing a new course at Harvard called Measuring and Reporting Health Disparities that included a three-part case study that would take students through the process of having to write uh, a state-level health disparities report. Um, And some of the feedback that I got from the students was this, this course is fantastic, we love it, but it's just focused on the state level. There's very little um, federal policy um, in the course. And then I realized, well, that's because I don't have any federal health policy experience. Um, and, so, and so then that started me looking for how do I get you know, federal health policy experience? And, and at that time, I was an assistant professor um, um, at, at Harvard and trying to figure out how do I, how could I potentially get that kind of experience you know, along with my academic um, position and so after doing some research, I found the Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellowship Program and also the White House Fellowship Program. Um, and so I talked to several of my colleagues and to my mentors, and I actually had a, 
had a friend at the time, friend mentor at the time, who had applied for both of those fellowship programs. Um, and she was able to give me some insight on the application process. And then she was also selected as a White House fellow. And so she was able to give me some insight into, into that program. And the difference between those two programs is that the White House Fellowship, there's a very short orientation period and then you're placed um, in, your, in your position um, in, the, in the White House. Um, and so um, I knew that I wanted a program that would provide a little bit more training uh, because I had no experience working at the federal level. And so the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Health Policy Fellowship Program includes a three-month orientation on how federal health policy gets made. So in our program, it's one month, where, and, and that program, although it's called the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation Health Policy Program, it's managed at the National Academy of Medicine. And so we're, okay. um, we're housed at the National Academy um, for that first month, um, it's, you know, just the cohort uh, that's in that fellowship at the National Academy. And then we merged with the um, uh, Congressional Fellows Program that's managed by the um, American Political Science Association, which is where our program merged with your program, and which is where, where, where we met. Um, for the remaining two months of that of that orientation, where and where that third month is really about you know figuring out figuring out your placement, but I realized I needed um, and I wanted um, that level of training. Um, at the time, I didn't, I wasn't as, or I, I didn't know I was going to be leaving Har leaving Harvard sort of um, during that time. So I was also thinking about you know, I need resources for my measuring and reporting health, health disparities course. And this three month orientation would definitely give me those resources to add the federal component uh, uh, to my teaching. Okay. Yeah. So um, we, we, I think when we talked about this before we did the podcast, but that the National Academy of Medicine also has the um, nurse scholar and resident residence. residence yes. yes distinguished nurse scholar and residence which i still i said it yesterday really well yeah. <laughs> it's so good today. Um, but you know there's that part of the orientation and then we all do end up going over um, to apsa and those days are kind of like dog years the amount of information um, that you're uh, that you're exposed to and uh, different skills so so you've gone through the orientation and then mm -hmm. talk about how you decided on where you wanted your placement to be Yes. So, um, so while the application process was happening um, for the Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellowship Program, so I, I should state too that the RWJ Health Policy Fellowship Program is the oldest health policy program. It was started in the early '70s, um, and it's a you know very prestigious program, and it's you know quite competitive. And so I thought I was going to have to apply multiple times, but I was fortunate to, to land a, um, a spot um, during my, my, first, um, my first application cycle. Um, I but also point, during- I want to point out one thing that you said that you did, and I, and I want other people that are considering applying for things to understand that asking somebody who's already done it and yes. getting their application as an example is a critical strategy for oh being my, yes. successful. And, mm -hmm. you know, and it worked out for you. You applied one time. You got mm -hmm. it. So yes, yes. You carry on. Yeah, and so, um, and so, also during this time, I was being recruited by the University of um, Southern California, um, and uh, the Davis School of um, the Davis School of Gerontology here at USC um, um, recruited me from the School of Public Health, um, and I'm you know the uh, the one public health scientist um, at the school. Um, but during this time. Um, as I transitioned, um, I transitioned to USC. So I moved from Rhode Island to Los Angeles. I was in Los Angeles for a couple of months, and then I moved to, to, to DC to start the fellowship. And so I knew nothing about California. Um, so th this is a long way to get to sort of what, how I made my decision. But, but I say all of that, to, yeah, I say all of that to say, I knew absolutely nothing about California. I had you know, lived in California for a couple of months and then um, left and, 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 and went to DC. So as I was thinking about the placement process, I was really interested in finding um, a placement that would teach me a little more about the state. And so um, I wanted to either, you know, be in the House or, or the Senate. I, I had uh, stronger leanings toward the Senate um, just because those individuals are in office longer. Um, and so um, I was looking for um, 
a placement in a California senator's office. And so I looked um, at Senator Dianne Feinstein's office. Um, she, had a, she had a very large, large staff and a health team. And I knew I really looked at this fellowship experience as a learning opportunity. I think, you know, many people decide to do the fellowship for different reasons. You know, some people want to, you know, take their what they their expertise and sort of, you know, apply it um, in a particular office. Um, my approach, and, and as we learned going through the orientation that that's really not the role or that's very rarely the role of the fellow. You know, you really, you know, you join an office and it's, you know, that office has its own policy priorities and you have to figure out how either what you do fit within those policy priorities or you get on board and, and start working on the things that, that they're working on. And so, I was looking for um, an office that could give me more um, education on, you know, the life of Californians. And so I was fortunate to interview um, in Senator Feinstein's office. And, and as you also recall, it's a match. So the office has to pick you. You have to pick them. Um, and fortunately, I was, you know, for the 2017-2018 academic year, I was their top choice. They were my top choice. Um, and I landed, and I was so happy that I landed in Senator Feinstein's office working with her health policy team. Right. And so one of the things um, with my fellowship, I was non-residential, but the Robert Wood Johnson, um, their health policy fellowship is only residential. So yes. That is, yes. that is one of the differences. Yeah. So um, in going through the application process, um, you commit to, you know, a year in Washington, D.C. Um, and so um, and with that commitment comes, you know, the process of going through the orientation and then either, you know, selecting an executive branch or congressional uh, branch placement, but you commit to, you know, at least eight months, you know, in that office um, in Washington, D.C. Okay, so tell me, you know, some of the things that you got to work on or some of the skills that you developed, you know, during sure. this time. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll I, I want to get back a little bit to the, to the, um, to the matching process because that to mm -hmm. me was also very surprising. And I think something that, that, that folks might be interested in. Um, I was, I not only interviewed in Senator Feinstein's office, I also, given that my background in public health, um, I was also interested in some of the um, um, committees that have jurisdiction over health and health care. So like the Health Education, Labor and Pensions uh, Committee and the Finance Committee. And so um, going through that interview process and in other offices. So, you know, I reached out to Senator uh, Kamala Harris's office and also to um, Representative Judy Chu's office, who was my representative with where we lived in California at the time. Um, and so, um, but I realized that oftentimes space and many sort of folks who work in space limited um, offices will recognize this, that, you know, if they don't have space for you, then they couldn't hire you. And so I encountered that a few times as well, where, you know, I was, there was a, some interest in, in the office, but, you know, they just didn't have the space. And so if they didn't have the space to hire one of us, um, a fellow, then, you know, you couldn't work there. So, so that was a bit surprising. The other thing was, you know, many of us haven't interviewed for jobs in a very long time. So having yeah. to write a resume, <laughs> you know, not counting academic jobs, because we all know that that, that interview process is, you know, in a whole other category. Yeah. But, you know, just interviewing for jobs where you have to get your CV down to the one page resume. And, and I, I cheated a bit, you know, by using the back for, you know, um, um, my citations so that, you know, the people interviewing me could see that I'd written some things on some, some health and healthcare related topics. Um, but yeah, that was, a, that was a, a, um, a, a challenging process if you haven't, you know, had to interview um, in a while. Um, I think too, I to, I was just gonna say, it kind of equates to that dissertation defense where you have to take three years of your life and put it into a 15 minute <laughs> Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. And, and the, the other thing is sort of thinking about, you know, what kind of office did you want? So, you know, did you want to be the health staffer that would, you know, staff the member, you know, on health topics and you go to hearings and, you know, be the, the health person in the office? Or do, do you want to work on a health team? Um, and I wanted to work on a health team. I wanted to be a part of, the, of a team and to watch the process and to really see how the policy process worked. Um, and Senator Feinstein's office, you know, had a team of people. There was a, um, a legislative aide that focused on health and then there's a legislative uh, correspondent um, and um, a couple of other people that were on staff that focused, you know, just on health. 
And so it was really, and senior, a Senator Feinstein that was a senior, you know, of the Senate. So anytime, you know, legislation was coming through that was related to health, it was always, you know, a good thing to have her, you know, co-sponsor that legislation. So we saw, um, you know, um, all or most of the legislation that came through that was health related. So, so those were some of the things that, you know, I was thinking about as I was trying to figure out, you know, where, where to land. Um, and so, and getting to some of the things, you know, once I got to the office, um, what I worked on, um, probably about 25% of my time was spent on what's called constituent visits. So, you know, folks will reach out to Senator Feinstein and they'll want to talk to her about an issue that is relevant to them. Um, and so I spent about a quarter of my time on that. Uh, Senator Feinstein was also co-chair of the Senate Cancer Coalition. So I worked on um, two projects in that space. Uh, so one was a letter to NIH to um, increase diversity in clinical trials. Um, and then the second was legislation to inform women um, getting a mammography of, of uh, breast density. And so that legislation actually passed. And so I worked with the team on, on, on that. It was, it was a really, um, it was a great opportunity to, you know, uh, hear input from, you know, some of my cancer colleagues. So as I mentioned, I was on the faculty at, at Dana-Farber. Um, and one of, the, one of the things I realized is that no one responds to your email faster than if you have a Senate email address. You That's know, true. people people will respond to you really quickly. So, I mean, I could, you know, send a note to some of my, you know, Dana-Farber or Harvard colleagues and get a response so quickly because we were, you know, working on the issue related to diversity in clinical trials um, in the breast density project. So explain the, the breast density piece, just for somebody listening to this, it's like, like how, like why was it a problem and why did it need a congressional? Yes. Yes. So, policy? so, so the issue is that, you know, the density of, of, of breast tissue can sometimes mask the presence of cancer. And so um, the legislation um, forces, um, facilities to notify women of the density of their breasts so that they can have that conversation with their physician to know whether or not there were additional tests that were needed. And so given that there wasn't, there was differential responses to this process um, across, the, across the U.S., uh, the Senate Cancer Coalition um, and some of the partners that, that co-sponsored that legislation felt like we needed a national response in order to, um, to address that issue. Okay. So it wasn't like related to insurance or financing whatsoever. It was truly just to help. It was like it was really about yeah. Disclosure. It was it was a it was a public health dis, um, um, dis, disclosure project and so or a process so to ensure that women were aware of uh, of the density of their breasts. Yes. Okay. So we've talked the, um, about your federal experience in DC and where, did you get to go visit the state office in California? Um, I, I did not get to visit um, the, the state office in California, although um, our office, uh, Senator Feinstein's office, had a very close relationship with, with, uh, with the state offices. So Senator Feinstein was a, um, a mayor of San Francisco. So, you know, she had really close ties to, you know, the folks back at the state, the state office. And so there were several projects that um, my, my health team colleagues got to work on. So um, one project I remember in particular um, was related to addressing homelessness in California. And so several of our um, health staffers traveled to California and talked to folks that were, you know, developing programs to reduce homelessness. And, and the reason I remember is because when those, you know, members are not in the office, then, I, then those who remain have to do the rest of the constituent visits. So during that time, the number of constituent visits that I had um, substantially increased. Um, however, I should state that part of the one of the great, another great things about the Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellowship Program is, um, is that we also um, had two state visits. So as a cohort, we selected, we had the opportunity to select two states in the country that we wanted to visit to better understand the interaction between federal and state policy. And at the time, there was a substantial discussion around including um, work requirements to the Medicaid program. And so we were interested in states that were 
either about to implement or attempt to implement uh, that policy into their Medicaid program. So we selected two states, Arkansas and Michigan. And at the time, both of those, at the time we were planning our state visits were, was also the time that those policies were going to be implemented. So that is in, we um, Arkansas in June of 2018 and their policy went live in June of 2018. So we had the opportunity to meet with folks at the state Medicaid office to talk to them about how that policy, why that policy was going to be implemented, how it was going to be implemented. Um, and so there was some state interaction um, that was part of our fellowship program. Okay. And then we got 25% of your time with the constituents. So what did you do the other 75% of your time? Well, so as I mentioned, um, so I mentioned the, the, the Senate Cancer Coalition work, um, but also, you know, sometimes when people enter these health policy fellowship programs, they assume, you know, let's say you you are an expert. So I'll just use myself as an example. I mean, you know, an expert on, you know, the, the, the association between financial hardship and, and health outcomes. So I'm assuming I'm going to go into the office, you know, and teach everyone about, about my research and they're going to get on board and, you know, we're going to write some legislation that ensures that as people are navigating healthcare, that we are addressing the financial hardships that they, that they have. Um, so, you know, congressional offices have their own priorities and, and, and one priority of Senator Feinstein was um, the health harming chemicals that are in personal care products. Now this was, I had done nothing in this space. I knew absolutely nothing about it. Um, but you know, as a um, working in an office, you learn really quickly. You do all of the research that you need um, to, to try to get up to speed on, the, on that topic. And so um, I worked on um, a project in the office um, that was focused on you know, legislation to address um, health harming chemicals in personal care products. One thing that I wasn't aware of is that you know, um, sort of the, the regulations around those personal, around personal care products and the chemicals that are in them. Um, um, the industry is pretty much regulates itself. And so when I first started, I remember going home to my DC apartment and reading the labels on every personal care product that I had, you know, in my shower and, and realizing that many of the item, many of the um, ingredients I couldn't pronounce and I didn't know what they were and I didn't know, you know, how or why they were in, in those products. And so um, I worked very closely with our, um, our, our health team on, you know, learning more about, you know, personal care products and the chemicals that are in them. And also, you know, memos to academics to learn more about them. Um, I reached out to several of my public health colleagues in D.C., um, also, memos seeking support for this legislation on top on this topic from um, from from beauty organizations um, to pull people on board to support the legislation. So um, so yeah, so I I learned a lot about chemicals and personal care products that you know I didn't know prior to entering the office. And and but it actually did make it into legislation, or you were so we were we were we we're writing legislation. So so you know at the time. Um, you know, I was in Senator Feinstein's office, which is a Democratic office, and so, um, and the off uh, the Senate was um, majority Republican, so it was very difficult to get legislation, you know, on the agenda. But it was legislation that that we that we worked on in the office, you know, so that you know, I think one of the one of the things that you or one of the things that you learn as a health policy fellow is um, the fact that the agenda of the Senate is is controlled by the party that's in the majority. And so if you're in the minority, it's quite challenging to get um, legislation on the agenda. Not that it's impossible, but um, if you don't have bipartisan support for, for that legislation, then it's very challenging to get that legislation out. So so my, my role was really on, you know, working on building the um, the coalition that was necessary in order to move the legislation forward when the agenda was more amenable to having uh, that topic on the agenda. Yeah, and also, you know, tens of thousands of bills are introduced every year and only two, one to two percent actually make it into law. Yes. But, you know, you would think for like a health related topic, there, that's not, in my mind, it shouldn't be partisan, but it that's because the policy might be all right, but then you got to consider the politics <laughs> that go yes. through that. So the three yeah. P's um, and then yep. the role of the press too. Right, yeah. right. 
Yeah, so I think, um, right. I mean, if even if folks are in support of it, ensuring that, you know, it's it's something that both parties can can agree to um, and can agree to all the components that's in the legislation before it gets to the um, on the agenda. Yep, a very important issue. Okay, and so this that was your only placement, right? You didn't because some people do two. Oh no! So yeah, so that was that was my only placement. Um, so okay. I, I was in Senator Feinstein's office for about um, eight and a half months, um, working with the um, with her health policy team. Um, and I, I will say, you know, it was a. I, I often say that it was one of the most remarkable um, experiences of my career. But I think when it was done, I was ready for it to be done. Um, I think um, I have found the career. Uh, that fits me best, and that is, you know, an academic um, or, you know, a professor. And so, you know, teaching and doing research, I think, is where where my skill set is is best suited. Um, but I, I, and I think I was just so excited by by what I learned about the policy process. Um, I often tell folks, you know, prior to going to Washington D.C., if someone had contacted me to learn more about, you know, my research, I probably would have just would have just sent them my paper or one of my papers, you know, on on the topic. And one thing that I learned was that that was that is not an effective strategy for communicating with staff. One because you just don't have time, you know, to 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 read and digest, you know, multiple, you know, academic academic papers. Um, without some sort of summary um, of of sort of you know the the um, the key points, and I think too, I was just also really excited to to take what I had learned and apply it to my teaching and to you know teach folks um, you know the the insider view of of how things make it through or not make it through you know the policy process in um, in the federal legislative branch. Yeah, Ellen, I actually talked about this too. You know, a lot of my work is around not only you have to do the gold standard, you know, with the peer reviewed publications, the journal articles and, and, you know, presenting with through posters and, and that type of stuff, but that's not helpful for the public. And so we mm. all have to have this skill set of how do you translate your science mm -hmm. to where people can understand it. And so mm -hmm. thinking through, so I've written this paper. Mm -hmm. But what is an innovative way to disseminate it to other people? So is it mm -hmm. is it a one page infographic? You know, mm -hmm. is it like a summary? Right. Um, even on my website, I was like, I need to do video abstracts for all of my publications. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. instead, if you, if you don't if you don't want to read the paper, you, I can just tell you in a minute, like right. give you the skinny. Yes. So I think thinking through how do we make our um, science more welcoming mm -hmm. to people, and and I do think that I don't know. I don't know about your, your office, but even looking for experts or looking for information on a topic, staffers go straight to Google. And mm -hmm. I was going straight to like the library at Duke. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I'm like, mm -hmm. this is, so you see the power of, you know, as a scientist of how, yes. how you need to have a, a presence online. Mm -hmm. And then how do we maximize that? Well, I think too, as, as academics, we're also accustomed, we're not necessarily accustomed to the pace of Washington, DC. So, um, it, you know, the, the saying is often like, you know, you're drinking from a fire hose, that information is coming at you that quickly. So for many of us as academics, we may see, you know, a note that we might get from a staffer and we're thinking, oh, I'll respond to that tomorrow or I'll respond to that, you know, in a couple <laughs> of days. I, and, and you laugh because you've been there because you know that if, if the staffer doesn't receive a response, like within the hour, Chances are, if they've used Google, they're going to the next expert. And so I think one of the things that was that I that I enjoyed. So you mentioned that you went to, you know, Duke Library to to try to find experts was how responsive all of my colleagues were when I when I reached out. So I so I mentioned, you know, earlier that, you know, nothing, you know, uh, facilitates a response like having a Senate email address, and you know, all of I was I I'm just so I was so excited to you know introduce my colleagues you know from Harvard and you know from the Harvard affiliated teaching hospitals um, to the staff in Senator Feinstein's office where they could offer to us their expertise on the various um, projects that um, that we were we were working on. Um, but yeah, it, it's a completely different world that many of us, it, unless we're in it just don't know how it functions. Right. So what's next for you? 
Um, so I teach um, a course called Aging and Social Policy um, at USC, and it's, um, it's an undergraduate, I teach the undergraduate version of the course and the master's um, level version of the course. And I've really taken a lot of the things that I learned in Washington, D.C. Um, for that course. So, um, so one thing that I pulled in was requiring, you know, writing one page policy memos, which was um, a, pros a project that all of the interns had to do in Senator Feinstein's office. And oh, and one thing I didn't mention was that I, I also helped to uh, mentor many of the interns. And I actually, there were a couple from University of Southern California. So it was really great to meet those students before I had actually been on campus. Um, and um, watching them navigate the process of, you know, being an intern in a Senate office and having to write a policy memo on a, on a topic. And so I pulled that component um, into the course. Um, also, you know, having, you know, access to all of the congressional testimony. So I've added, you know, mock congressional testimonies to my, to my course. Um, and so, you know, just making sure that, and introducing um, the students to all of the, the res research resources. So I'm not sure how much you had the opportunity to work with the Congressional Research Service. But I just found that office to be amazing. So the Congressional Research Service, for those of you that don't know, is the research arm of Congress. Yes, Congress has a research arm. Um, and so it was great that they had so many. They'd already written papers on you know, various topics, or you could just email them and tell them what you were working on, and they would you know, gather you know, research resources. Um, and so introducing my students to, to that resource, because now many of their reports, um, their reports are now open to the public. Um, historically, they, they weren't open to the public. Um, and so I think what's next for me is, has been um, trying to apply as much as I learned to my courses to share what I learned um, with, with my students. Um, it's also adding more of a policy focus to, to my own research agenda. I think one of the things that, um, one of the benefits of doing these national um, health policy programs is that it forces us as academics to situate what we do within the larger um, policy agenda in Washington. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that that process can also make you feel so incredibly small because, you know, what you do is such a small piece of the larger federal policy process. But I think it's it's also helpful to 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 see that because it de it definitely helps you think about, you know, how then do I bring what I do to the attention of policymakers when they are managing all of these other other topics. So, so I've tried to add um, you know policy issues or you know policy topics to my to my research program. So, um, one of the things that I'm one of the projects that I'm working on now, which was a project that was just recently funded um, by an internal grant here at USC, is uh, to conduct a policy scan of COVID nineteen related policies that impact vulnerable populations. And in this project, we are defining vulnerable as racial and ethnic minorities, um, older adults, um, and undocumented immigrants. And so we're looking at federal and state legislation um, and uh, federal and state policies um, to, to create a repository of policies that directly impact the health and the financial well-being of vulnerable populations that's, that is COVID-19 related. Okay. Um, anything in, in particular jump out at you so far around with the older adult um, population? Um, so we're, we're just starting. We just found out that we got funding, I think, uh, sometime last week. So, okay. um, so yeah, so we're still, we're still building the, the, data, the data collection tool. Um, but um, we definitely, um, I mean, older adults was a, a, a key component, especially given the disproportional, um, the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 um, on older adults generally and on older adults in nursing homes in particular. So thinking about, you know, the policies and the legislation that uh, directly impacts, you know, older adults is a key component of the project. You should talk to Joanne Lynn. They have county level data for every county in the U.S. and she was on the pod, uh, her podcast will be coming out um, soon too, but it's mm -hmm. a huge data set with MDS and OASIS. So, oh, great. Um, yes, yeah, and, and I will, I will check out like her work. Duels. Um, I'll send you that information great. after, after great. this. But. <laughs> great. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with me today. And You're I'll welcome. get you connected um, to Joanne. And mm -hmm. 
um, it was just great to connect with you. Great. Nice to connect with you. And thanks so much for the invitation. All right. Thanks. Take care. Yep. Thank you for joining me today for This Is Getting Old. If you'd like to know more, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. And if you have any questions or a related topic you'd like to hear from me about, just let me know. Thanks.